Hello, we're going to talk about the 2023 VCE Specialist Maths exams. I will say before we get into it, uh, probably do not watch this video until you've actually attempted the exams for yourself to get that real practice exam experience. Uh, but having said that, let's look at some of the questions and reflect on what we saw here in 2023 as the first year of a new study design and what that tells us about 2024, 2025, uh, or wherever you're watching this exam uh, in the future. So first question is this rational functions question. Part A, show that we can express it in this form, which is quite handy for sketching the graph. Part B, sketch the graph for three marks. Um, we've got the grid there, often we do we are given a grid and that grid is not only for you, that grid is also for the assessors. So don't forget that, um, try to make sure your points are in the right place. Obviously you don't want to spend too much time um, with every single grid box, but with the, with the intercepts, you know, asymptotes obviously should be in the right place. And then it doesn't hurt to just get a few key points to make sure your shape is okay. Especially around the asymptotes, we don't want to curve away. Um, we don't want to lose a mark for something like that. Question two, this complex numbers question is a little non-standard and different, um, you know, to the standard complex numbers questions, equation solving we often see on exam one. Um, the key is to use polar form. We'll come back and look at that one. Question three, kinematics question. We're given V, we're given X, we're asked to find acceleration. So V D V D X is the form for acceleration we want to use here. Assessor's report said this question was not that well done. So maybe a hint that that would come up again. Um, even this question, the implicit diff question, assessor's report said, you know, students had some trouble with this. So perhaps we'll see another implicit diff. Still worth practicing those. So question five, integration by parts. Again, uh, brand new to the study design 2023, pretty likely to come up again. So practice those integration by parts for exam one. Question six is a probability and stats question. You know, they have to put some probability and stats on exam one. It makes sense to ask this sort of uh, sum of random variables question. Here we had three random variables, but we're just using the formulas from our formula sheet to find the mean and standard deviation. It makes sense to put that on exam one and then leave the sort of hypothesis testing style question for the extended response in the exam two. Question seven is a surface area question. So again, new to the study design 2023, we're using a formula from our formula sheet. Again, that's a new formula. And then obviously I uh, work out the integral in this case, it was a U substitution, I believe. Question eight is a proof by induction. Um, we saw proof by induction here on exam one. We saw it in Northern Hemisphere exam one. So again, pretty likely that that trend will continue to see a proof by induction on exam one, and then not so much logic and proof on exam two. Uh, it's a four mark question. This one was not that easy. You know, even the base case took a bit of work. So we'll look at that one uh, in a minute. Um, but if we just look briefly, so question nine is a, a plane, you know, vectors question about a plane in 3D space, six marks here, and then also a whole extended response question uh, in exam two as well. So lots of marks uh, on vectors and particularly lines and planes in 3D space, cross product, normals to planes, that sort of thing. So well worth practicing, well worth your time, uh, much more so than pseudocode, for example, where we just saw one multi-choice question. Uh, in both this exam and the Northern Hemisphere exam too. Question 10 is a vector calculus question. This is more of a standard question we've seen for years. Um, find the Cartesian equation and then an arc length, but it's a circle, so you don't really need the arc length formula. It's more just the circumference of a circle formula. And part D, uh, this question about the position being perpendicular to its velocity, sort of turns into a bit of an algebra uh, trigonometry question. Okay, so let's go back to some of those more interesting questions. Maybe if we look at this proof by induction question first. So a function f has the rule f of x equals x e to the 2x. And this is what we're proving using induction. So f bracket nx represents the nth derivative. That is, f has been differentiated n times. So to prove the base case here, uh, n here is actually our first derivative. So in n equals one, we need to take our first derivative. We can do that using the product rule. And we should be able to show that what we get is this expression when n is equal to one. But you can see that I've got like four or five lines of working just for the base case. 
So in that case, you know, the base case was not such an easy mark, but often, you know, the base case, you're just subbing in n equals one into left hand side, right hand side. So the base case often should be a reasonably easy mark. Uh, the assumption again should be an easy mark. And all we're doing there is taking the proposition for n and just replacing it with k and saying, putting the word assume in front of it. You do need that, okay? We need to make it clear that this is an assumption we're making. Uh, proof by induction does require an assumption and then a proof. As far as the actual proof, so it did take a little bit of work. Um, what we're proving, well, we just take our expression, replace n with k plus one. And we need to prove that based on our assumption. So what we're doing here is we're differentiating what we had above from the assumption. So we're differentiating this. Again, we're doing that using the products rule. And then we need to do some algebra, taking out a common factor of e to the two x uh, and showing that what we get is this expression, which we had um, for k plus one. So of course the proof part, the induction part is gonna take some work and some algebra, but the assumptions should be straightforward. You know, just be careful with how you write it. Don't mix up n with k or k with x. Um, and the base case should be reasonably straightforward. So even though proof by induction can be a hard question, you know, the first few marks should be something that everyone can get if you just take a bit of care. Okay, so let's look at this uh, complex numbers question. Consider the complex number z is equal to b minus i all cubed, where b is a positive real number. Find b given that the argument of z is negative pi on two. So it's a little bit confusing because z is like the cube of something. And then we're given this information about the angle of z itself. Okay, so we put those two statements together. We're told that the argument of b minus i all cubed is negative pi on two. So it makes sense to use polar form because we're given this information about the angle. Uh, we actually don't care about the modulus, the length of the complex number. So what we can tell from Dumois theorem, remember the cube of a complex number would have three times the angle. So the original complex number B minus I would have an angle of negative pi on six, or well, that's one possibility. You know, there's gonna be three possibilities equally spaced around the unit circle. But here we're told B is a positive real number so B minus I is going to be somewhere here in the fourth quadrant. And I think that diagram really helps as well. So dividing negative pi on two by three, we get negative pi on six. This is our angle for B minus I. From that, we can pretty easily work out using exact values that B has to be root three. And we didn't have to consider um, the other two roots. One here is going to be in quadrant uh, three where B is negative root three. And the other one I think is gonna be up here on the imaginary axis. So takeaways from that question, I think, you know, use polar form, given that we are given some information about the angle. Uh, also a nice clear diagram makes it easy to think about the problem and see what's going on. All right, let's move on to exam two. Let's start with the extended response. I'm not gonna go through a lot of questions in detail. Um, but just looking at like, what were the questions, um, which areas of study were they devoted to? You know, because we do have six areas of study and generally six extended response questions, but we haven't seen like one question per area of study, which they could do, um, perhaps they should do, but that's not what we've seen. So question one was this question of sort of functions and graphs, but then it moves on to, um, you know, calculus, parametric equations, um, and some arc length. Question two is a complex numbers question. Pretty much we always see a, a single extended response question devoted purely to complex numbers. So that's good, you know, predictable for you. This was quite a nice question, actually, probably my favorite extended response question. So we might come back and talk about this one a bit more detail. This was the part, this is a proof that students found challenging. Question three, another calculus question, a solid of revolution and a surface area, uh, surface area and volume again, and again. Question four, calculus again, this time differential equations and particularly the logistic differential equation. So just 10 marks pretty much devoted entirely to the logistic equation. Interesting question here where we're given um, the first derivative in terms of Q and we had to find a second derivative by implicit diff. That was, apparently not done that well. 
and then a graph sketch was actually sketching the logistic equation. So I don't think they'll ask that again. Like it's pretty much the same every time. You can't really ask for that same sketch every year. More likely the sketch should be a rational function, but let's see. Question 11 again, vectors. Again, it's planes, it's distance between lines in 3D space, angle between line and plane, that sort of thing. And question six is a probability and stats question. Again, very predictable, always seems to be question six, uh, always follows a reasonably similar structure. You know, we've got our hypothesis testings, uh, state the null and alternative hypothesis, find a p-value, you know, make a conclusion. Um, then this thing about the type two error, such a shame we had an, an error here where the things were mislabeled. Some students said they, they spent 10 or 20 minutes thinking about this mark and what was going on. It shouldn't be an error in the paper, but at the same time, you shouldn't be spending 10 minutes thinking about a one mark question. Like surely there's other questions in the paper where you can pick up that mark, whether it's picking up one of your own errors or getting another question, um, rather than getting bogged down and stuck in one mark. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on this complex numbers etc. response question. We had W as cis 2 pi on 7. Um, part A verify that W is a root of z to the 7 minus 1 equals 0. So verify, we're just going to sub it straight in, you know, take it to the power 7 and then subtract 1. We don't have a lot of space. It's probably a bit of a criticism of this question in a few places that we're supposed to, you know, show our working. We've only got two lines there, but I think the assumption is we're going to go you know, across at some stage or maybe go in two columns. Um, anyway, so list the other roots. Again, not a lot of space. We've got to list uh, six more roots in polar form, but there they are. And then plot them on the um, Argand diagram. So equally spaced around a circle, seven roots. Fair question for two marks. Next part, sketch the ray that originates the real root of z to the 7 minus 1 equals 0 and passes through the point represented by cis 2 pi on 7. So this question and the next question students found difficult. So a ray originates at the real root, so that's here, okay, z is equal to 1, and then passes through the point represented by cis 2 pi on 7, that's this point here. So open circle for a ray and then an arrow is going in this direction only. The next part of that question is actually to find the equation of that. And they've given us a form arg z minus z0 is equal to theta. So z minus z0, well, this is originating originating at the point 1, 0. So we need a z minus 1 here. And then what is this angle? There's a little bit of geometry here. If we look at this triangle, it's actually an uh, isosceles triangle. We know this angle is 2 pi on 7 should be, sorry, that should be 2 pi on 7. So using an isosceles triangle, we can work out that both of these angles must be 5 pi on 14, and then this one must be 9 pi on 14. So maybe the fact that the ray was not that well done means that we'll, you know, see some more rays to test students in the future. So remember open circle and then one direction. Part E, verify this can be expressed in this form. So verify, there's two ways we go, I guess. One is we could factorize this and then use long division. Well, that's gonna take a long time. <laughs> I think easier is to verify by expanding this and show that we get back to z to the seven minus one. And that is gonna take less time. Uh, I still didn't actually show the working, but just expanding, you probably get like 14 terms there and most of them will cancel. Okay, so part F1 and 2 were the interesting ones. Um, express cis 2 pi on 7 plus cis 12 pi on 7 in the form A cos B pi. So what happens here? Because 12 pi on 7 is actually negative 2 pi on 7. So when we expand out to cos theta plus i sine theta, uh, what happens with the sine theta is they're actually going to cancel out. Sine of negative 2 pi on 7 is actually negative sine of 2 pi on 7. That's going to cancel. So all we're left with is two times the cosine of two pi on seven. So this is going to relate directly to part two, given that cis two pi on seven satisfies this equation, used in Moab's theorem to show this. So, okay, let's plug in cis two pi on seven into this equation. Well, we know that z minus one is not gonna equal to zero because this is not equal to one. So it must be this bracket that's equal to zero. Uh, and this is what we're going to use to Moab's theorem because we've got to take this complex number to the power 6, to the power 5, etc. Or what's going to happen, we're going to multiply the angle by 6, by 5, etc. 
Now, here's where we're using part one, where we showed that when we add these two complex numbers, what we get is just two times the cosine. And that must be useful because look at what we're trying to show here. These things just have cosines in them. Um, so what turns out to happen is that, you know, cis 12 pi and 7, cis 2 pi and 7 turn out to be 2 cosine 2 pi and 7. And a similar thing happens with 10 pi and 7, 4 pi and 7, 8 pi and 7, and 6 pi and 7. Because those are like 8 pi and 7, for example, is negative 6 pi and 7. If it's not clear why that works, I think it helps to show a diagram. This is, for example, 2 pi and 7 and negative 2 pi and 7. If we think about what's going to happen if we add those two complex numbers together, we're going to end up on the real axis. Okay, Think about like adding two vectors. Uh, we're going to end up on the horizontal here. And we're going to end up at 2 times the cosine of theta. It's going to happen in the same way for, for these two pairs. Um, and that will basically complete our proof. So quite a nice question there a good test of understanding of complex numbers and also structuring a proof. Um, as far as the other questions, I might just talk through a few of the multi-choice. So this was the logic and proof question on the multi-choice. I'm um, just understanding of contrapositive. Uh, question four looked a bit hard, but when you just plug it on the CAS calculator, pretty much just pops out. Uh, question five was a little bit hard, again, like using complex numbers in polar form. Um, and then sort of having to match up z squared is equivalent to which of these. I think the diagram helps quite a lot with that question. Uh, this question was not that well done, only 37%. So it's a rate in, rate out question. It's one of those ones where the volume is changing because we're pumping in 20 liters and pumping, oh, sorry, we're pumping out 20 liters and pumping in 15 liters. So the volume is going to decrease by five liters every minute nothing's going in and then our rate out, we can work out in terms of Q. Um, but yeah, the fact that that was not that well done, perhaps indicates they'll go for that again, um, not just on the multi-choice, could be even in the extended response. But the worst done question on this exam, only 18%, uh, was this question here. If the sum of two unit vectors is a unit vector, then the magnitude of the difference of the two unit vectors is... I actually really like this question. It's my favorite uh, multi-choice question. I was surprised to see only 18% of students got that. Um, the key is to draw a diagram. Think about the sum of two unit vectors. If that itself is a unit vector, then these two vectors must have an angle of 60 degrees between them because that's basically an equilateral triangle. Mm -hmm. Once we know that angle is 60, well then think about the difference of the two vectors. So instead of adding this one now, I'm subtracting, so I'm going in the opposite direction. Then I'm looking for this length here. And it's just geometry then. Okay, if I know this was 60, this angle must be 120. So I can use my exact values or, or cosine rule or whatever to find this uh, distance. This is root 3. I think it's, students found it hard because maybe it's a little bit different, but the key there definitely is to draw a diagram. All right, I'm going to leave it there for now. Feel free to leave any specific questions in the comments, but uh, that's it for now.